Welcome all for this panel discussion of academic job interviewing, what to expect, and uh, transitioning into a prof professorial position. Uh, we have a third panelist scheduled, Dr. Pereira, and I'm not sure if he's coming. Uh, he um, had agreed to participate, but he may be tied up in something, I'm not sure. So we may have a third person walk in yet, <laughs> but it won't stop us from getting the excitement started here. Uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Uh, Brett Ar uh, Aberbanel. Is that? Uh, you're pretty close. close uh, Aberbanel. Aberbanel, <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, which is uh, uh, exciting because she earned her PhD here at UNLV, went away to uh, UCLA, and then has recently come back in August. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So fresh back on campus as a faculty member at UNLV. She is the director of research at the International Gaming Institute here at UNLV and also a professor in the William F. Hara, uh, uh, William F. Hara College of Hotel Administration. And then we're delighted to have Dr. Susanna Newberry, who's an assistant professor of art uh, here at UNLV. So both have been through this process of applying for, interviewing for, and being hired in uh, a, an academic position here at UNLV, uh, which means, again, they have walk the steps you are walking, some of you right now, literally. And I will say, uh, besides uh, how excited I am to hear from both of them about their tips and experiences on this process, um, I just walked out of a faculty meeting where we are preparing for the first of several job candidates coming on campus starting next Monday for the same process of an academic job interview. It's a very rigorous several day process, lots of committee interviews, lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews, meals. It's a rigorous um, life of passage, as it were in the professoriate uh, trajectory. And uh, we were reminded of all the regulations that apply, the questions that have to be standardized across the applicant, stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think about in your roles, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into planning for these uh, processes. But saying all that, uh, we'll turn the stage over to uh, Dr. Uh, Abarbanel to kick things off, and then uh, after that, Dr. Newberry. And again, we'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions uh, in our Today. Thanks. All right, thank you. So Dr. Gray asked us to start with just first a little bit about who we are, what we do, and how we got here. So I'll, I'll start with that. I, I did my undergraduate degree in statistics and architectural studies, mostly history of architecture. Um, I, I almost never used the second degree, only the first really, and, and I realized pretty early on that statistics was a degree that uh, could be applied to just about any field. So I grew up in Del Mar, California, which is a tiny little beach town just north of San Diego, and about 25%, 30% of the land that Del Mar sits on is taken up with a horse race track. So I decided to take my statistics degree and uh, write a prediction algorithm for the results of horse races so that perhaps I could fund my summer activities without getting a job. Uh, and that, frankly, is the first piece that led me to get, becoming the director of research at the International Gaming Institute, where we do research on pretty much anything that falls under the gambling purview. So that we're, we're very multidisciplinary. Um, where we're, I mean, my tenure home is the hotel school, but we do research in policy, problem gambling and addiction, uh, sociology and psychology, so gambling behaviors and interactivity. We do, um, uh, I mentioned po policy research and uh, through the International Center for Gaming Innovation, or for, for gaming regulation, we have the Center for Gaming Innovation, so there's innovation and game development research, and sort of everything that falls in between those topics. I ended up uh, coming to Las Vegas, I got my master's degree and then my PhD here. So I actually, after getting my master's degree, I also entered, then, I, before I matriculated, I interviewed for jobs outside academia. So things like uh, mathematician at uh, slot manufacturing companies. If, you, if you're in the math department you didn't know that was a job, add it to your list. <laughs> it is, it's a very cool job. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, marketing, uh, hotel rate, uh, setting through uh, MGM, all these different jobs that I thought might be interesting, and I said, you know what, uh, I really like doing research, so I decided to get my PhD. So I, I got my PhD through the hotel school here at UNLV. I applied for jobs as I was finishing my degree. I ended up at UCLA first as a postdoc, and then while I was there, I transitioned into the research scientist series, which is basically a research faculty. They have two separate parallel tracks there. And then when this job opened up here at UNLV, um, that sounded great, so I applied for this one, and luckily I was given an offer, and I took it and started just last August. Uh, so that's how I got here. Um, and then 
should we do introduction first and then jump into tips sure. or whatever? Yeah, let's do yeah. that. Then you get a <laughs> yeah. sense of sort of different preparations and different backgrounds and how we all wind up here. So I'm Dr. Newberry. I'm an assistant professor of art history in the art department in the College of Fine Arts. I did my undergraduate degree BAs, both of them in art history and creative writing at a liberal arts college called Oberlin College in Ohio. I then took two years off. I worked as a secretary at a law firm, and I moved to Germany to do language skills that I needed. And then I did my PhD at Yale University. Um, I applied only for academic jobs, and luckily in my first year on the job market, I had several campus visits, several conference interviews, um, and I got this job. So somehow I was able to get here straight out of graduate school, which was really um, strange and gratifying and rare. I mean, often the job market takes many, many years of postdocs and so on uh, to get to what many people feel is like the ultimate job, a tenure track position at a university. Um, to say that my experience is an exception uh, is to recognize not that I'm particularly good at what I do, but rather that every single job search has its own idiosyncrasies you may or may not be hired, not because of you, but because of the needs of the department, because of personality fits, because of funding for a position and other contingencies that you are just not gonna know about. Um, so please don't feel as you're going through this application process and thinking about it as a larger trajectory that um, any kind of traction means that you're definitely gonna get something, because it unfortunately doesn't mean that but also that any kind of rejection is, is don't feel like it's a um, referendum on you. It is absolutely not. Um, and even though getting rejected from things feels very demoralizing, it's important to know that that um, really does not have anything to do with your ability, your preparation, um, or anything like that. So when we talk a little bit more about strategies, I'll tell you how I was given advice to sort of prioritize and optimize my work, my presentation, and how I sold myself. Um, and if I could say anything, just one thing in closing, it's that when you are on the job market, it is perhaps your first experience becoming a colleague to your professors. If you're in grad school, whether you know it or not, you have a somewhat sort of subservient relationship to them. Perhaps you work in a lab and so you owe them in some way. <laughs> or your advisor is someone you talk to about revising your dissertation or your master's degree. The biggest sort of conceptual hurdle to get over in going on the job market is to be confident in yourself that you are ready for this job, that you are ready to be a professor just like your professors are, and that you can manage interaction in a um, collegial, polite, but also assured manner to not be supplicating, basically. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of the actual interview um, in a minute. And I, this perfect segue actually into one of the notes that I've written here, which is that, uh, like Suzanne said, you're, they're looking for a colleague. So it's more than just show that you're, you're equal to them as a colleague. And I apologize if I'm stepping on the toes yeah. of anything that you were going to say later. Uh, it's so, one, you have to show that, yes, you, you view yourself as, as some, another faculty member in the department, not just a graduate student who's going to have to ask. I mean, you'll, you'll probably get wherever you go, if they, hopefully, if they're doing it right, a, a mentor of some sort who'll be able to say, oh, yes, yeah, these are the different bureaucratic steps you'll need to do, much like you have as a graduate student. But you, you, a lot of the stuff, you are now in charge. You are the PI. You're going to be the one who's, who's doing everything. At the same time, during this interview, they're not just looking for someone who has that confidence. They're, they're looking for someone that they'll want to work with. You, you spend a lot of time with your colleagues a lot of faculty meetings, don't you mm -hmm. mentioning that you've just been there with your colleagues, and uh, they want someone they're going to get along with. So, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you are talking about a topic that happens to be either controversial or debated in some way, you know, don't say, oh, no, 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 don't be an idiot about this. That's, that's not perhaps the best way to communicate. And I know that seems like an obvious piece of advice, but uh, collegiality is such a huge component of of the job search that I think that that's a, uh, you know, a really key piece. Now, I mean, you have to be outgoing or, or have the perfect thing to say every time, but you have to demonstrate that, you know, it's, it's not particularly difficult for you to get along with other people, I think is probably the most straightforward way of putting it. When you interviewed for your postdoc? Yes. So I was wondering, maybe it'd be helpful if each of us sort of talked through a process that was successful in the application. 
season? So like what happened in order to get that postdoc? What sure. happened in order to get the research job? So I work in an odd field. Um, my process was not the normal academic job process where you find a job listing on, say, uh, Chronicle Higher Education or some other listing on a university website and then you apply for it and go in. Uh, my specialty is gambling. I mentioned this is very, it's multidisciplinary. So the jobs that I applied for are not, for example, my, my degrees in hotel, my degree in statistics. Um, I did not apply for any jobs in hotel programs or statistics programs. Uh, I applied for jobs. My postdoc was at a medical school, not a medical doctor. In fact, um, the, at UCLA, the, it's not a requirement, but it's highly recommended that you wear your badge at all time. Your ID card is actually a badge at UCLA Health. Uh, and I did not because I am not a medical doctor and I did not want someone in an emergency to ask me for medical help <laughs> that I would not be able to provide. Uh, so within my field, and if you work in a similar niche field, you might have the same experience, it was all about networking to actually get the opportunity even to apply for a job and then hopefully get an interview. Um, to For my postdoc, I applied for, uh, I, think, I think I started with two jobs. There were others that I was planning to apply for and then I didn't because I got a job offer and I figured I'd just go with that. Uh, applied for two jobs, and there were very different experiences. For the postdoc, uh, my uh, advisor at the time said, oh, you know, one of our colleagues, Tim Fong over at UCLA, mentioned that he's looking for postdocs. Let's just email him and see if he has any available. So he emailed uh, Tim, copied me on the email, and Tim said, yes, we do. When will you be in LA or San Diego next? Please come in, we'll chat. And that's how I got an interview, and that was the whole process to get an interview for that job. Uh, the other job I applied for was actually also in medical school. Um, uh, Harvard has a division on addictions that has a gambling specialty, and they had a research position open, a research faculty position open, and that was a much more uh, standard process. We, I had to apply online with all of my information. I had to provide letters of recommendation, a CV, and all of this information. And um, they, I had a formal invitation to fly out for an interview, and it was the a much more traditional academic interview, the, the whole day thing. Um, and I we'll get into that I think in a second with what to expect with that. Um, and before I flew back, and that's of course you know so you schlep all the way over to Boston from I was based here in Las Vegas, and then and then you're exhausted, but you have the whole day's worth of stuff to go through, and then and sometimes multiple days depending where you interview. And then, and then I got to fly back and go back to being a grad student, which, as I'm sure you're familiar, is, is exhausting in and of itself. Um, so there were very, very different experiences to get to the interview, the actual interview. And I think that, and I'll let you speak to your own experiences. I'm guessing they were more similar to the second versus the first. Yeah. yeah. So um, while I was in graduate school, I had other part-time jobs. I worked as a freelance copy editor. I worked as a managing editor of a magazine. Those were much more like what you're describing with a sort of network um, job opportunity. And those are jobs that I could have pursued and kept, but I chose to go into the professorate because I wanted to research and teach. Um, and art history, though it's a small discipline, has its own professional associations. It has its own uh, way of teaching and etiquette and skill set to master. Um, and so as opposed to other humanities disciplines, I found my jobs on uh, an art history specific listserv, which for me, the season for posting jobs is basically August uh, to December for tenure track jobs, December through February for visiting assistant professor, and February through March for sort of like loose end jobs. Fellowships also usually come in the fall. So this is to say there's usually a, a calendar of when jobs are posted, what kind of jobs are coming up at different points in that calendar, and knowing that should help you strategize and build out what kind of jobs you're applying for, with what timetables, and what expectations. Because when you're approaching the job market for an academic job, you need to think in those different categories. If your goal is to be a tenure-track professor, look at one group that's all tenure-track jobs. That may or may not work out. So you also need to look at term-limited professorships, a visiting assistant professorship, a postdoc or a fellowship. And then you also need to think about fallback strategies. 
There will be listings for instructors, for adjuncts, for uh, short-term appointments that just came up because the university couldn't make a hire. This is part of what I mean by saying that when you start the job market, um, don't, don't get disappointed by rejection because the job market cycle goes on for about nine months every year, which means you will be full-time job applying for jobs, <laughs> potentially for nine months of a year, and it's important to know that. It requires an immense commitment to specificity and detail. So for me, I applied to 15 jobs and postdocs and fellowships. That process began in August and continued, honestly, until May. Um, I got a campus uh, an interview at my conference for one job, which was a visiting assistant professorship to replace someone on maternity leave. I can talk about that, the conference interview process. I then uh, gave a campus visit for that job. And while I was on my campus visit, four days before I handed in my dissertation, I got a call from UNLV. I hadn't heard anything from them since like the beginning of December when I submitted my application. So that's three months of radio, I had totally given up, it was three months of radio silence. And they said, we have been going through these applications and we'd like to invite you for a Skype interview. When are you available? I happened to be camping in Joshua Tree at that moment in time, so I didn't have service for three days. Um, but eventually I got out of the desert and I called them and I said, sure. And they said, can you come in five days? And I said, can you make it seven? And we agreed. So I did my Skype interview with them and then they set up a campus visit shortly thereafter. I didn't get my letter of offer until like May 10th of that year. I graduated May 17th, so I filled out the paperwork, was done with the paperwork around May 15th, and then moved here July 1st. So again, a long timetable full of different deadlines, different expectations, and so on and so forth. Um, but as a sort of opening salvo, thinking about the different levels of engagement, professional engagement, that you would be open to in terms of professional jobs is important. Do you need to stay in Las Vegas? If you need to stay in Las Vegas, have you considered high schools? Have you considered postdocs at sort of random places, random institutes in the university? If you want to prioritize a geographic location for you and your family, that's totally fine. You want to be in Chicago? Apply for every single job that's in Chicago. Or you and your family um, are from Tennessee and you really want to be in the South? By all means, please go do that. Um, if you want to apply wherever and see how it goes, that's fine too. But I think one of the big things that feeds into this sort of level of comfort and collegiality when you go and interview is showing a genuine interest in being there at the institution, in the location, because one thing above all that uh, other faculty members are looking for is a colleague that fits, almost like a family, because you're potentially hiring them for 40 years. A colleague that is motivated to be in that location and to grow the strengths of that institution. Um, and you know, fair or not, a colleague who's not going to jet off in three years for a better job. And, and you may feel like, I'm taking this job and I really want to be at Hopkins. You know, I'm at the University of Texas in Arlington. I really want to be at Johns Hopkins. Your colleagues don't need to know that at the interview. As far as they're concerned, Arlington, Texas is the place that you want to spend the rest of your life and you will do everything in your power to make Arlington, Texas the best that it could be. Okay? So we all know what happens on the job market, how frequently people move around. Um, but your job is to really, A, think about what you want and need for you, your career, and your family. B, where that might be, what kind of institution it looks like and see to convince everyone around you that like this is your job. They would, they would miss out on so much if they didn't hire you. They, they already know that they need to hire you because you're so perfect. Um, and we can talk about how to do that as we go through. And I think that's really good. And I'm just going to add on to this with uh, other things to think about. Uh, if you're going to apply to every single job in Chicago, you know, you're probably going to be going outside your discipline because there's a lot of jobs, and Chicago's got a lot of schools, and they've probably got a fair amount of jobs. It's still going to be quite competitive. Uh, but if you go outside your discipline, be very specific about what you do and why it's relevant to that discipline. So, for example, if you are in uh, political science and you apply for a job in sociology, you better tell those sociologists why they want to hire a political scientist. So, uh, and, and that's even starting back from the application, because you have to, I mean, in the interview, obviously, hopefully by that point, you, you've convinced them that it's 
possible to hire a political scientist and that will be relevant to them. But it is certainly important to keep that in mind. It, and that sort of also ties into the it, tailoring your application to the place that you're tailoring for. But I think that, that uh, you know, in the interview in particular, you're really going to have to remember to that you know, you're, you're a little bit of a black sheep in that case. And you have to explain why uh, you know, that's, that's good to have. Um, it's, uh, you know, be able to tell that story in just a few sentences, too. So I'm, you know, I, I, I work in the gambling field. I'm from Las Vegas. Most of the time, I work with the industry over other aspects. If I'm going to a medical school, well, most of them, their specialty is gambling addiction. So I have to explain to them why someone who spent so much time working with the industry suddenly is important to a group that works with addiction. And in that case, it actually ended up being pretty easy because no one over there worked in recreational gambling or industry research or that sort of thing. Um, that was a, a gap that they had and I, I filled that gap. I filled the role of the person who does the sort of everything else that isn't gambling addiction. So that was my uh, explanation as to why, why I would fit in there. Um, and that also, oh, and I was going to also speak to uh, different disciplines also can apply with some of these, these timelines I think too. Uh, with the, at least in hotel and, and some of the gambling positions as well that fit in that, there's not really a timeline where the tenure track jobs come out first and when you're visiting professorships and the postdocs. M pretty much everything sort of comes out in the fall semester and then whatever, so whatever wasn't filled or whatever didn't get departmental approval ahead of time will then come out around January for applications later throughout the spring term. Um, when I applied uh, the, the job, it, Harvard, that one came out in, um, the listing came out in October. I applied for the job and went for the interview, uh, I would like to say in late January, early February. Uh, they gave me an offer mid-February. The, uh, the March, or excuse me, the, the UCLA job, I wasn't listed at all. I just sort of sent the email in early January. I went for my interview early March and received the offer mid-March. So that's, that was the way the timing ended up working out on that one. Um, I will say I have overheard people in the hotel school uh, comment on how, at least in, in our field, because most of the jobs come out in fall, uh, the people who are applying for the jobs that are more in spring it's a much more limited group, and uh, it tends to include the people who didn't get the jobs in the fall. So it's, it's sort of a mix of, don't worry, the comments weren't super negative. It wasn't like, oh yeah, these are the dregs that are applying <laughs> for the jobs. Now it was more, um, you're, you're going to get the people who are uh, probably broadening their interest. If you didn't get the job you wanted in the fall, now you have to expand a little bit to, to apply your specialty. Um, in those spring jobs, and then also perhaps the people who just haven't really gotten around to applying for jobs until now, and that can mean a, a myriad of things, it, uh, laziness, mm -hmm. or um, you know, you were busy with writing your dissertation, which I happen to think is a perfectly adequate <laughs> excuse for waiting to apply. Uh, so those, so these types of things come in, and so uh, timing there also a very specific thing when it comes to that sort of getting yeah. to the interview. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know if this ends up being a, a discipline-specific thing, but sort of the, the content of the interview itself. In the more traditional academic interview, it's, it's going to be either a full day or full multiple days. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will include a lot. It will be exhausting. You will get up probably at 5 or 6 in the morning and be done... 10-ish after dinner, yeah. that's all right. I'm okay. trying, to be, trying to be conservative here, probably not later than that. Uh, in hotel, where we also happen to have departments on food and beverage and wine specialties, sometimes it can go later. <laughs> uh, but it is an extremely exhausting experience. You will do, among other things, uh, the probably first and foremost important things that you'll do are the teaching presentation and the research presentation. And you might not have both. When I applied for the director of research job, I only had research presentation as part. And this was actually, a, again, that was a separate experience. That I didn't come to campus for the interview. This was all over Skype, actually. Uh, the, um, I mean, the, so with research presentation, if you're applying for a research-only job, they, they might not have you do a teaching presentation. Um, but for most standard tenure-track jobs, you're going to do both. 
Uh, with the hotel school, we had some folks come and interview for different jobs last fall. What we did with the teaching presentations, uh, if it was possible, we had them teach one of the classes. They came in, the, the, the instructor would sit in the class with their class, and that person taught that class to our actual students. It wasn't just a presentation teaching example. And um, you'll also, you'll, you'll have a meeting with the dean, you'll interview with the committee, you'll have meetings probably with the graduate students, they'll ask you questions, you'll have meetings with the faculty, you might even have meetings with some of the staff, you'll have organized, uh, probably breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, I know I'm missing something, what else have well, I missed? Okay, that's a good question, <laughs> and we have a new person. Yeah. So I'll, I'll interview okay, briefly yeah. and just say, uh, this is Dr. Pereira. Uh, so uh, welcome, in, uh, and Dr. Pereira is in the Educational Psychology and Higher Education Department and can also add expertise regarding the international aspect of this. You're, you're from Australia, is that yes, right? Yes, So in terms of also thinking uh, of, of how might this interview process work differently in different countries, mm -hmm. some of you may be applying not just in the United States but to other countries. I had a friend who applied at, in an interview to Cambridge and it was a wildly different process from mm -hmm. the, the, the two-day on-campus UNLV experience. So these are the things to be considering as well in this uh, job uh, uh, market and interview process. So uh, with you coming in this moment, why don't we have you share a few thoughts like your brief um, experience interviewing and getting the position here at UNLV. You also held a position prior to this too, right? Um, yeah, held, held two previous positions. Um, I prepared a, a slideshow, is that possible? Oh, yeah, um, well, let's, let's pull that up um, and while you're doing that too. So we're, we're in a general moment talking about what that process is like being on campus for that interview process. And again, it can vary by country. It can vary, it can vary by places that may have a teaching um, demonstration versus one that will be a job talk focused on your research or places, again, that have done or that require both. So all different varieties depending on discipline and so forth. Well, how many of you in the room are um, in PhD programs for liberal arts or humanities or political science? Is this applicable to any of you? Oh, yes. One. Okay. So the rest of you, um, what are your disciplines? Because then we can know sort of how to give you advice that's not just based on one kind of job. <laughs> Engineering. Okay. And would you like that? Are you aiming for an academic job teaching? Yes. Okay. Public health. Okay. And? I'm not so sure yet. Okay. 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 Criminal justice. Okay. And do you want to teach? Are you? Yeah. Okay. Public affairs and uh, academic job. Okay. Engineering, uh, academic. Okay. Engineering, uh, then you. Okay. Uh, anthropology, academic. Okay. Higher ed, student services. Okay. Um, engineering, uh, economic. Okay. The same. The same. Oh, it's so many engineers. Computer science and uh, in the long term. Academic. Yes. Okay. Or mathematics, academic. Okay. Awesome. I'll keep, well, I'll keep that in mind as we keep talking. Sure. Um, so I, I thought I'd give you a, a bit of uh, context and background around my interviewing process. I've interviewed in three countries uh, for six positions, of which five were successful. Um, the one that was not successful was probably the one that had the most heuristic value for me, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, just to give you a bit of background to set some parameters and context for what I'm talking about. Um, I, my education is largely um, centered on education psychology, psychology broadly speaking. Um, I've held positions at the University of Southern Queensland, University of New South Wales, Australia, and most recently here. Um, I'm a quantitative psychologist by training, but I apply that uh, to the field of educational psychology. And much of what I talk about today will be broadly relevant to both education and psychology, but please put restrictions on um, that. Beyond that, I'm not sure of its relevance. Some, some general things might be of relevance. Um, and there's my interview experience. So I've interviewed at a um, medium-sized regional university in Australia, as well as a very large metropolitan university that's in the top 50 in the world. So two very different experiences interviewing and two different um, desires and wants from those two institutions. In terms of my interview experience at United, in the United Kingdom, it's pretty much the same. Um, one relatively small university with a um, world ranking of around about 600, but one that's top 20 ranking in the world. So again, very different experiences there. And finally, the United States, where I my first um, foray into uh, the interview experience here was unsuccessful, but the second here was, was successful. Um, 
the first thing I'll do is, is draw some comparisons. So there's a, a table showing what the interview experiences are like as a function of the US, UK, and Australian systems um, with respect to some domains that I see as critical to the interview. You're going to need to provide a letter of interest, a curriculum vitae, and some details of, of referees. Now, typically in the Australian system, um, in the United Kingdom, you're, you, you're writing your letter of interest against very finite selection criteria. So there are going to be specifications of skills, knowledge, um, and your understanding of the field. And you need to address those um, critically over about eight or nine pages. So there's a lot of detail. Uh, I juxtapose that against my US experience, where my letter of interest was about three or four pages, and not really addressing a selection criteria that's finite but speaking to research, teaching, and service, broadly speaking. Um, moving into the intermediate stage where we have a Skype or a telephone interview, that's non-existent in the Australian and UK systems. So there's no intermediate um, or intermediary interview process where um, there's a short list of candidates. In the Australian and UK systems, we move straight from the selection process through the paper trail to the interview of candidates physically. Um, and that moves me to the selection committee composition. Um, I enjoyed my interview experiences in the United States because my interview panels were largely based on within department people, uh, people who had an understanding of my um, research field, broadly speaking. Moving into the United States and uh, so the UK and Australia, uh, the interview panels were largely comprised of senior administrative university personnel, um, deans, associate deans, um, depending on your position sometimes, um, deputy vice chancellors. So you, could, you have a panel of people that uh, perhaps don't understand your work very well, um, but, and oftentimes don't understand your field very well. Uh, so you have to tailor that research presentation that you give to, it's a nice way of putting this, um, I guess to the tenor and the manner of the people um, with whom you're interviewing. The experience in the United States was considerably different where I had um, essentially expert colleagues interviewing me. Um, the questions were much more focused on content, um, substantive knowledge of my field and how I intended to advance that field. Um, whereas the questions with respect to the UK and Australia were more in line with um, general where I see myself in five years. Um, with respect to my teaching, my research, and my service, broadly speaking. The campus interview is also vastly different. Um, we know that the US interview system can last anywhere from one to two days. The Australian and the UK interview process lasts anywhere from one to two hours. Um, so you have to make your argument for why they should select you in a reasonably short period. Um, that's the struggle with both, both of those systems. Um, you make it or you break it in 60 minutes. The position at New South Wales, uh, University of New South Wales in Australia was a direct appointment, so my interview lasted 15 minutes. Um, I was in the now. Um, they wanted to have contact with one referee, and they hired me. Um, you also have to recognise that you were one of several interviewees on that day in the US and the U in the UK and the Australian system. Um, so it's very likely that you'll bump uh, into your fellow competitors for the same position and you may even um, have lunch with them. So that can be a little unsettling at times as well. Um, Mealtime meetings, uh, perhaps those things that I despise the most, um, being a habitual neurotic. Uh, I had several meetings here, and my other position that I interviewed for. Uh, there are no mealtime meetings in Australia and UK systems. Uh, you move in, in and you're out. Uh, negotiation. I think within reason, in the US system, I negotiated successfully with UNLV within reason. Um, there is no negotiation with the Australian and UK systems. There's very little room, uh, room to move. They offer you um, a set package, and you basically have to accept that. There is some wiggle room around negotiating infrastructure for your research, and the higher you move up the academic hierarchy, I suppose, the more flexibility you have with that. Um, but uh, the package that I was offered was the package I had to take. Um, 
the UK and Australia are also very generous in their packages, so sometimes there's no real reason to negotiate that initial package. In terms of your offer, um, with the US we know that that depends on your sequence in um, the interview scheme. In the Australian and the UK system, sometimes you hear the very same day or the next day. So the, the wait is over pretty quickly. Um, those are just some general ideas, and I'm not entirely sure that they generalise across many different other institutions, um, which is the main thing that you should take out of this. But in terms of what I find has been the most helpful in terms of receiving heuristic feedback from each of my interview panels, um, I follow up whether I'm successful or not with each of my interview panels, um, are, the, are, the, are the points that I have on the present slide. Um, when you present either to an interview panel regarding your research or to broader, broader faculty and broader university members, I found these particular points helpful. Uh, you need to demonstrate synergies between your research program and your department co uh, colleagues' research programs. Um, that's what I've had time and again um, advised to me in terms of why my interviews were successful. Um, I could demonstrate that synergy between what I was doing and what I was seeking to do in five years' time and how that aligned with department objectives. Um, you also need to demonstrate productivity, quality, flexibility, and the longevity of your research program. Productivity, um, quantum. Uh, how many articles have you published? How many are you going to publish in the next few years? Uh, quality, I use metrics. I use metrics for everything. They're flawed, but they provide people with a reasonably objective way of looking at the research that you've generated. So I use Cymago indexes. Um, impact factors, general quartiles, SJR impact factors. Um, my CV is riddled with these, so I have them against every publication that I, I put out. Uh, flexibility, you need to demonstrate to your interview panel uh, how your research program responds to emerging issues of the age, how it can evolve itself to respond to arising social problems. For me, that's relatively straightforward. My substantive area is in career choice. Um, how people's interests and their dispositional characteristics influence the careers and educational pathways they choose. Ten years ago, we had the arts education movement in Australia. My research program as an undergraduate and a graduate was able to respond to that um, because I could look at what characteristics allow people to enter the workforce with respect to arts education. Now we've had the STEM wave. My research program can respond to the issue of um, ensuring vital infrastructure workers for STEM enterprises. Um, that type of demonstration is important. Uh, longevity of your research program. You're going to be asked the question inevitably where you see your research program in five or ten years' time. Um, the next point is an important point. I think you need to be able to demonstrate to your interview panel that your research program can survive without funding and develop, but thrive under those circumstances. A lot of interview panels don't want candidates whose research programs hinge fundamentally on funding. There needs to be a way around um, the decline that may be if you don't um, receive funding for your research. So that demonstration is quite important. I, I've always found the next point to be very important to, to interview panels. Um, demonstrating that you have sufficient data when you first begin an academic position to last you about two years of quality publications. Uh, typically when we start we have new teaching assignments and some service assignments um, that we may not have engaged with previously. So you're, de you're developing new teaching material, contributing to um, all sorts of panels um, while trying to conduct novel research. If you have an existing data store from which you can publish for the next two years, you build yourself a safety net um, where you might not have as much time to go out and collect data or do the types of research that you need to do. Um, so you can see your dissertation perhaps as um, a research program that lasts a little bit longer than just the production of the thesis. Um, the final point was particularly important to, to interview panels. I, I demonstrated in each of those how um, my research programs and specific projects within that program uh, could be funded by specific programs by the NSF and uh, the Department of Education. Uh, so I would typically provide a tabula, tabular presentation of my research project, um, an NSF funding program, and when I intended to apply. Uh, and they all, uh, no, normally uniformly across the board, they thought that that was um, a reasonable thing to do as well. Also, 
suggest if you're in a field where it's not uncommon to receive funding from other sources besides the, the big government sources, uh, like NSF is a huge one, NIH is a huge one, those sorts of things, show that as well because there's always uh, huge fluctuations in that type of funding um, and a number of different factors. And they're they're also very difficult to get. You know, it's uh, so if you can if it's if it's not uncommon in your field to receive funding from other sources. So for example, in, in engineering, um, I don't know, I'm going to use our local examples. I know we have some engineering students who get funding from some of the game development companies, so like Sci Games or uh, uh, Bally's or that sort of thing, or not Bally's, Bally Technologies. Uh, that they have funding available for things like engineering projects, or if you work in some of the other fields, and there's funding from other sources as well. So uh, the variety of funding sources that you might apply for is also valuable. Yeah. So, no, uh, no. Just, just to add on to that. Yeah. Uh, with, with the funding agencies that I mentioned, uh, the, the success rates are notoriously low, yeah. only 13 or 14 percent. The Australian Research Council, which is the analog um, of the US National Science Foundation, has a funding rate of about 9 percent. So typically, we would need to look beyond um, federal government funding and you look at um, industry bodies for, for that type of thing. And that's particularly true of fields like engineering, where you're much more likely to get um, industry funding than you are in educational psychology. Um, that's really all that I had uh, on the basis of the cumulative experience that I've had. Um, OK, so audience, <laughs> what, what's on your mind? really basic, like what do I wear? Yeah. So one question I have is, uh, what are some recommendations you have to get some information about the objectives of the program they have in that school, so that when you present, you actually associate your work with them, yeah. or I mean, yeah. emphasize on the, I mean, links. Yeah. Because it'll say things like, but department obviously, your title, the continuation of it in tenure track or non tenure track, perhaps your expected um, teaching field. So, you know, maybe you need to teach engineering 101, but you also need to teach some random class in one particular computer program. Um, that could be and should be in your job announcement. It will also say what the course load is, which will give you a clue to whether they prioritize research or teaching. Um, generally, if it's a lower course load, so let's say two, two, two per semester and under, it's research focused. If it's three, three, they're going to want you to do everything. And if it's higher than three, three, at least in my experience, the implication is you're primarily there to provide service content in the form of teaching. And you must maintain your own research practice, but the majority of what you'll be evaluated on is your ability to fill class time. So that's one way, like carefully reading the list. When you get to writing your cover letter, you're going to go to the website for that university, you're going to go to the department website, you're going to look up every single faculty member and make a list of those who you think their work in some way speaks to yours. You're going to think about other departments that your work interfaces with and look those people up. So basically from the moment you intend to apply to a job, you are working through the available material on the internet to figure out how you work within an ensemble and you're going to put that in your cover letter. Um, if you get to the point where you have a Skype or conference interview, it's important at that point to find out more about the character of the institution. Um, and I mean that both of the one you want to go to and to think about how your preparation is a fit for that. So you're going to want to know, is it an Ivy League school? Is it a Research One? Where do they get their funding from primarily? Is it a liberal arts college? That'll help you shape your expectations. Furthermore, um, it's interesting to note whether it is a minority serving institution of any sort because there are a lot of things that correlate with that. Will I be working with first generation college students? Will I be working with undocumented students? Will I be working with people who work full time? Because that also you need to demonstrate a familiarity with the culture of the institution in terms of how you expect your work with the students to go and in terms of your being prepared to balance your research and teaching. You also need to prepare a committee um, for where you come from. So think about the values of being at UNLV. For me, they are uh, a minority-serving institution. 
um, big class sizes and finding a way to give a liberal arts education even with 70 students in the classroom. How do I reach each student? How do we develop critical analysis? How do I allow them to build research even at the undergraduate level? Same thing with my grad students. Um, coming from Yale, uh, for me, some places were like, oh, that's great, yeah, no problem, you know how to research and you're so fancy, like, we got it, you're committed to ideas. And other places, including UNLV, had real reservations because they didn't know if I knew how to teach. You know, they didn't see four years of demonstrated adjuncting, basically, in my own department. Um, and so in that case, thinking about the culture of UNLV was important for me to be able to say, I come from this place. Here are the basic uh, philosophies I apply to any teaching situation, to any classroom situation, to any research situation, and here's how I would do it in this new environment. Um, so again, it, it's a lot of sort of investment at the beginning in researching the amenities, the cultures, so on. The last thing I'll say is that you also want to look, just Google it, for junior faculty awards and opportunities. Because the institution will want to know as, um, as some of my colleagues have been saying, how you plan on sustaining your work. Is there a $4,000 fellowship for someone working in robotics? Is there a $200 fellowship for someone to take a student to a conference? Is there a $25,000 scholarship? Is there an office of funding and research? Um, you can find all of that out through the website. And so that's part of thinking creatively about how you can sustain your work within that institution and to show them that you already know everything about them and you are ready to go on day one. From day one, I know I can do this, that, and that. My plan in my field, it's not articles, it's books. My plan is to have a book proposal done by my second semester here at the university. I'll take it to the conference the next year. I plan to submit my manuscript on this date. And my second book project, which usually you pull out of your ass, is this. <laughs> okay, so you really need to be thinking in terms of that long tail. Um, in some ways, it's difficult because you have to tailor it to every institution. In other ways, you just switch out the names. You know, like, I am excited at Pomona College to engage first-generation college students and expand their horizons and blah, 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 blah. You know? I mean, it, I'm making it sound light, but it's true. It's true. Um, so if you come up with, like, a firm constellation of those things, how do I fit? What departments do I work with? Who can I be collegial with? What kind of students? What kind of funding opportunities? You can sort of mix and match. And also don't forget, a lot of the, um, I mean, it depends on how broad your discipline is. I mean, Cheryl, I know you're in anthropology. Actually, no, Cheryl. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, that, that's a huge broad, engineering is a huge broad, but also within these disciplines, there are sub-disciplines. You're not just an engineer, you're an electrical engineer, you're a material science engineer, there's so many, medical engineer, I mean, there's so many, so many different kinds of engineers that you can be. And I found that as you get into these niche topics, you start to see a lot of the familiar names as you write your papers and create you know, literature reviews. You, you see other people's research. So you're not just come jumping out of the blue, usually, to go into these interviews and saying, like, oh, I have no idea what anybody at this school does. Um, it's really not uncommon as you prepare for an interview, like, oh my gosh, I do recognize that name, a Barbanel. I saw a Barbanel over here when I was writing this paper for something, something. Let me go look that up. And then, and then because if you can speak to, uh, the academic ego is a very real thing. <laughs> so if you're able to show up at your interview and say, oh yes, Dr. Barrow, it's great to meet you. I read your paper on women who play poker, and we go, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be like, yes. You know, that's, it's, it is. We, yeah, I mean, we, in some ways, we can't help ourselves sometimes, no matter how much we try. But it feels really good, especially as an academic, where frequently you, you publish and then, you know, let's say the article sort of goes off and it sits there in an academic journal forever. It feels good to know that someone actually read the work that you put together. So that, I would say that that's also a way to sort of build that up it's, uh, as, as you go through them. Are you raising your hand as I open my mouth? <laughs> okay. I hear both good and bad um, in terms of the content of the cover letter to include a personal connection with that, um, the applied department versus, well, a meaning that uh, I'm so I'm looking forward to work with mm -hmm. Dr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. I was actually told, do not put that sort of information. Is that different by different I would, actually, I would agree with that in the interview that's when I would sort of, I guess, let loose and say, 
you know, like I noticed that Dr. So and so works on this and this and this. I work on this, and I think it's a great fit to to match that. Oh. You're excited to work with all your potential colleagues. Yes. <laughs> if yes. you name them in a letter, then that could have an undesired effect, which is to say, you know, the person who's on the committee who you did the list, you know, that yeah. candidate doesn't know who I am. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> to, to speak to the academic ego yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, but sense. also, you have to recognize that faculty, once they're in an institution, um, can sometimes feel trapped by an institution. And so um, you may come in and say, I love this thing that Latour does, and I love this thing that so-and-so does, and name all these big things. The faculty at that institution want to know that you're interested in, in them as a group, um, and that you esteem them just as much as you esteem the top scholar in your field. Because um, all joking aside, I mean, that's how you treat your colleagues, based on respect um, and mutual admiration. And so, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> name individual candidates yeah, for that yeah, reason. Yeah. But I think a general, I don't know, yeah. a general statement, I really look forward to the opportunity to get to know you, speak to you more. There's no question that during that interview you're going to forge connections with some folk more than you will with others. And my experience was with uh, a person with whom I work now uh, very closely. Um, in that interview stage, we, we uh, talked about potential projects and how both of our research programs could potentially find gaps in each other's research programs respectively. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't get to that level of specificity with a cocktail letter, a cover letter for, for that very reason of um, you know, potentially isolating individuals and not paying due respects to others. Yeah. Uh, when, when you're applying uh, for one of these positions and say you researched like most or whatever reasonable amount of the uh, faculty and the departments you plan to work at or the position you're applying for, is it better to apply for um, uh, a school where there are people already uh, researching on your area or there is nobody researching on your area or what is like a good range compromise to find out because I don't want to go and have conflict with somebody right. yeah. that is doing the same thing I do right. or nobody's doing that, they don't know what I'm doing and they oh, we don't want to touch that or right. something like that. So let's say that they are looking for an, your computer science, right? Mm -hmm. An assistant professor in what's one subfield of computer science? I'm sorry? What is a subfield of computer science? Uh, artificial intelligence. Okay. An assistant professor of artificial intelligence. And you think, that's great. That's exactly what I do. Read the cover letter. I mean, the job posting. See if they mention specific qualities that speak to your research. Like they need to have expertise in X, Y, and Z, these programs, these blah, blah, blah. Then you're going to go to the website for that department. You're going to see if they have someone who specializes in this, if they have a senior person who specializes in it, which means that those person's interests are covered, and therefore you would provide a slightly different emphasis on that. Whether you can see your role, if no one else teaches it, building bridges with other professors. So does artificial intelligence correlate with some other kind of coding, or whatever it is. Um, so from my point of view, um, it's not necessarily that no one does what you do or everyone does what you do, but you always need to position yourself in relationship to what other people provide there. And, and I think sort of like you were saying, you can make an argument, like if you're a political scientist but you're applying for sociology, is that because they don't have a social theorist? Is that because they don't have a quantitative sociologist? I mean, it could be anything. And, and I would definitely also emphasize, like, if you're going to work in the same field as, it, it, you know, they want more than one person in the same subfield, you know, to show how you can work together. And, and the example I'm going to give is an actual example from when I was at UCLA. Uh, and it, it sort of came to a head only a few months after I got there. It was so I, I got to observe the end product of this. Um, so, so there were two researchers in my department, both of whom worked in... Um, sex addiction. And they completely disagreed uh, on what is apparently a very hotly debated topic in this field, which is whether or not sex addiction is actually a thing. One believed this is this concept of hypersexuality, and one believed it was actually an addiction, a behavioral addiction that, that has uh, physiological components to it. Uh, and it, they, they hated each other mm -hmm. passionately. Uh, there actually were restraining orders filed against wow. each of them. That, that's how, how bad this 
uh, this this debate got. Uh, this is in my de in the department, um, and this is not even just. So, so where, where I was housed at UCLA, I was in was called the Gambling Studies Program, which sounds fun and exciting and relevant to what I do. There were like 10 people that's part of the greater Department of Psychiatry, which was like 110 people. So this is just in my program. <laughs> Uh, and, and eventually, uh, one, of, one of these two folks left because it just it got to the point where you know, they, they, they weren't agreeing on anything. Every time one would write a paper, the other said, no, we can't put the gambling studies name on that paper. That doesn't, you know, that's, that's not what everybody at the gambling studies program thinks. We can't all get behind that or at the very least support the views of, of the colleague. And that was specifically the point, support the views of your colleague. Uh, when, when that was decided that the two of them couldn't do that for each other. Uh, one eventually left and went to another lab on campus, uh, and that finally ended the whole debacle, at least I internally <laughs> for us. So, so to bring that back to what you're saying, again, to reiterate, um, the, if, if you're going to be doing that, I really emphasize how, how the work is complementary. Uh, not necessarily that you guys will get along. You, you might not. You might not like each other at all. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> uh, but at, le at the very least, show how uh, there, there is you know, a, some overlap. And that can be a good thing if there's some overlap, to, to show how those two things work together. Uh, what, are the, what, uh, what are the best sources to find uh, academic vacancies? Uh, depends on your field. <laughs> Probably not the answer you were looking for. Uh, in engineering, oh my gosh, the name is escaping me though. I've, I've been familiar with it before. The, there's a huge society of engineers, the four, at least, uh, no? Yeah, Monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monster, yeah. yeah. And Monster is a huge, huge, huge society mm -hmm. that usually the, yes, yes, yes. The societies themselves uh, will host job postings on the organization's website. That's t very typical. And that's for all disciplines, whatever your discipline up being um, uh, so that's probably the first place I would recommend looking there are others I think I mentioned earlier the Chronicle of Higher Education has a, a job uh, a huge job listing site uh, some of them are listed also um, on, on public job search sites though you're probably not going to find quite as many there as uh, specifically academic uh, and then another way, actually, that I might recommend, if you have a target university that you want to go to, go to their website. They'll, their HR they'll website. always put, yeah, their HR will always put all of the current available jobs online. For humanities, you can look at HNET. Um, so that would count for you for anthropology and humanities and social sciences is HNET. Um, but think again, of, think again of all these different websites as like having sieves that have different um, meshes. So like, uh, the Chronicle website will have a lot of different jobs, and they may or may not be useful to you. Your professional association website will have jobs specifically geared towards your discipline. Um, a sort of, a, a sort of uh, like disciplinary wide website, like a humanities listserv, or I'm sure there's a social science one, will you know, say, you can teach history, you, you know art history, could you do regular history? And if you think maybe I could, you can apply for it there. Um, you want to be working through all those different levels to try to find every opportunity. The other thing I'll say is that postdocs, sometimes they're posted to HNET or to Chronicle or whatever. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they remain on individual uh, university websites. And so one thing that I've done is to just Google yeah. <laughs> humanities postdoctoral fellowships and the year range. And some schools, like the University of California, Berkeley, has an amazing website that, co that <laughs> lists every single postdoctoral opportunity by discipline available for that academic year and has links to go directly to apply to each of them. Um, if you know organizations that grant, for, so in the humanities, the uh, Andrew Mellon Foundation usually has teaching and research postdocs Go to that website and see what's available for this year at the NAH, the NIS, whatever. I'm sure they all have them. Um, but again, you know, lots of different ways to do it, and your job is to create a dragnet to just find <laughs> everything, everything that you think could possibly be worth applying, and then you whittle down. That was your question. Sorry, I wasn't looking at you.
thing I heard I emphasize by all three of you is comments about um, politics. So you don't know what they are entering this system, so be very careful how you tiptoe through things. If you should say things too assertively, uh, you never know what shoes or political divides you may be stepping into. But also don't engage in the gossipy stuff. Uh, don't go down that avenue. But be aware, I think this is kind of alluded to, that from the moment you get off the plane until you get back on the plane, you are on. And everything you say will be sieved through all the filters they're thinking of in terms of looking for that colleague who may be with them for decades to come. So the collegiality, the fit, the what's in the position, but what other things were not in the position because they were political or other things that may be operating behind the scenes. But you're on from the moment they meet you in the airport till you're done. And one of the hardest things will be eating your meals. So choose carefully what you eat so you don't swap it down uh, you know, in the front of your, your dress or shirt. Even, or, even the moment you get ready for a Skype interview, we're going mm -hmm. back a little bit. Um, any, any moment you have contact with a potential employer is a profession, you're being interviewed is a professional opportunity. So um, you have a Skype visit, you need to be dressed in a suit or you know this dress is fine it's a black dress from the waist up it looks like I could be a nun you know if I were really interviewing I would have my hair pulled back that's a sort of standard for women pull your hair back don't have it on your face minimal makeup either earrings or something like decorative on the neck not both black gray blue always tight Heels, if you go on a job interview, less than two inches. Make sure that they are comfortable to wear. Okay? Nail polish, either clear or none. No red, no decoration, no lipstick. I say this because um, I've certainly been told this by women academics at every single level. And also, I've been privy to gossip about uh, job searches. This person isn't serious because she had red nail polish. This person looks too rich. This person looks too prissy. This person didn't wear a suit. All of that matters. So you're going for clean, professional, probably for both men and women. You're looking for an outfit that neutralizes your gender, that neutralizes, in some sense, your um, potential political stance, and that allows the interviewer to focus on what you're saying, to see you as a mind and a person um, and in no way as a distraction because people are, you know, people are shitty. So really just plan for the worst. That's um, interesting. I agree. Well, it's true. I mean, yeah, I agree. Um, one of the things I also had, and, and this sort of has come up with the different politics and what you're saying, you know, gender neutral, all of this. There are some very specific questions, certainly in the U.S., and I'm, I'm guessing also Australia, UK, I'd, I'd let you speak to those two as well, that are, there are questions that are illegal to ask you know what those are. Uh, they can't ask you if you are married. They can't ask you if you are planning to have kids. Uh, they can't ask you a, a myriad religion. of other questions. They can't you, ask you your about sexual religion, orientation. Your sexual orientation. And, uh, and it, I believe it's a technically legal to ask you about your political views, but you don't have to answer that. That's not. Uh, now, at the same time, if they say, oh, I notice you're wearing uh, an engagement ring. Are you getting married soon? Maybe thinking about starting a family, that sort of thing. Uh, do not say, that's an illegal question. <laughs> that's not the right response. But at the same time, you don't have to answer it. You can brush it off. You can just sort of say, oh, yeah, I got engaged recently. Move on to the next topic immediately. Um, you, but, so those types of things, you, you really don't. And if you're asked those questions, comment on it to your advisor. It might be the type of thing where it might be the type of thing where they are trying to get information. There are ways of getting those pieces of information without expressly asking for it, uh, or they just may be ignorant idiots, uh, which many, I mean, keep in mind, the people who interview are usually not HR experts. I mean, there might be in some of those UK and Australia examples, <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, even, so even in the hotel school, where one of the disciplines is human resources, <laughs> there will be people who are going to say, oh, I guess you're wearing an engagement ring kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's there. So they might not even realize that what they're asking is not permitted. So be, be aware of those and be be able to deflect if that that comes up. And and you can also I mean you can this sounds terrible but you can use it to your advantage. For men, having an, a wedding ring means that you're stable and committed, yeah. so you're going to stay <laughs> in that job. For women, having a wedding ring or an engagement ring means culturally that you're going to have kids soon, that you're not going to be as committed to your job that after you have kids, you're not going to continue in that profession. 
So for women, I really do recommend that you do not wear wedding ring. You're laughing, but it's true. <laughs> On the other hand, if you are applying to work at a religious institution, like Brigham Young, or Southern Methodist, or a Catholic school, think very carefully about the signification that that has. That could be a good thing. On the politics issue, I have a colleague who applied for a job teaching art history at Brigham Young, and she was asked whether she engages in out of wedlock sexual relations, whether she drinks, smokes, drinks coffee, and because it's a religious institution, it is permitted to ask those questions. You don't have to answer them, but you need to find a creative way of addressing it. Um, the last thing I'll say about that uh, is Sometimes that may affect the content of what you do. So for example, art history, especially art history before the contemporary moment, there are a lot of naked women and a lot of naked men. At Brigham Young, you can't teach anything that visually has nudity in it. I don't know how they handle biology, but at least in art, <laughs> you can't. Um, and that may be the case at different institutions. And so again, think creatively, think carefully. Um, Given this particular political climate, if you're a person of color or have an accent and are going to specific parts of the country, any part of the country, be aware um, that you will need to anticipate your audience and present yourself. If you're international, um, they can't base a hiring decision based on your nationality. So as, as far as I know, I think that's I a characteristic that's, that's prohibited. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another thing to get away from. If they want you, they will hire you, and they will help you get uh, your work permit and things like that. So um, again, just being aware of all of those things in order to protect yourself and sell yourself in the most you know, correct and amenable way possible. Um, my, my experience with it was um, a probing question attempted to see whether I have kids. Uh, presumably kids slow down productivity. I'm not too sure if there's any that. Um, but the question was, it, it, it's good to be back in Sydney, um, good to have your family around, um, and with your mother around, there'll be a babysitter. Um, uh -huh. and, and the interviewer <laughs> had no idea that I had kids or uh, anything. She, he, uh, the person was aware that um, my family was around, my mother was around. Um, the way that I deflected that was simply saying that it's great to have my mother around. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they do probe. Um, I, uh, during the interview experience here, one of the most uncomfortable experiences was um, the campus, uh, the, the city tour. I was driven around uh, uh, potentially for, for rental accommodation. And uh, the questions around how, how large do you need your house? Mm -hmm. um, you need to deflect those. Um, so the, the way that I did that was, uh, I'm not entirely certain at this time, uh, but, but the areas that I'm interested in are, uh, that, that was a reasonable mm -hmm. way of deflecting that. Mm -hmm. the, the most common one that I've seen is, how do you spend your Sundays? Ooh. Mm -hmm. Resting up for the work week ahead. <laughs> yeah. That is your answer. You don't have to come up with a new one. <laughs> I've never had anyone ask me what I do in my free time, but yeah, the answer would be, you know, I am dedicated to blah, 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 and I prepare for the week, and occasionally I see a movie or something like that. I came to my campus visit here, and I had been informed never to order a glass of wine. Don't, just don't order alcohol if you go out to meals, um, unless it becomes awkward. So I came here, <laughs> and we went to Bahama Breeze for my third meal of the day. I'd been meeting with people for 12 hours at that point and having the same conversation, because you really do have the same conversation over and over again. So by that point, at 7 p.m., I'd given my lecture. We go to Bahama Breeze. I've never met these people before. There's no information about them on the website. Like, I really had to scramble. And I sit down, and one of them says, don't you want a glass of wine? And I said, no, I'm OK, thank you. And he said, why? You don't want a glass of wine? And I said, no, thank you. I'm a good water spot. Do you drink? And I said, oh, I think right now I just prefer. And eventually, I had to order a glass of wine, because they were going to ask me, basically, whether I drink or not. Um, and so at that point, it would have been a bigger deal to refuse than to just say, shut this guy up, I will have <laughs> one drink. One glass of one drink maximum. I'll even say, discipline specific, there's a food and beverage department in the hotel school, and you can use that opportunity to show what you know. Yes, I happen to know this is a particularly nice vintage of wine. I'll order a glass <laughs> from that and demonstrate my expertise in this area. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
what is the best way of uh, answering this question? That's the as uh, What question do you have from us? Okay. What is your question? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say there's certainly a few different ways of it. Uh, honestly, I, there's a bunch of sort of generic questions that you can ask, but I would ask the ones that have meaning to you. Is there something in particular that you are curious about in that specific school or in that specific region where the school is or the city where the school is? You know, um, uh, what? Uh, you know, how do you enjoy living in the city? Because you know those types of things, rather than super generic things. I, I really think I really like when people pinpoint to our to the specific program as opposed to or like don't don't ask. Oh, what does your work day look like? That's the kind of thing you might see on the, the, um, a job interview website yeah. advice kind of thing. That's. You know, that's, it's so different for every academic. Well, I sit down and write for 20 minutes, and then I answer emails, and then somebody calls me, or I get an email from a student who has to come in right away because they forgot to get a signature on this, so then suddenly that takes up 10 minutes out of my afternoon that I was going to be going over. You know, it's, it really depends on, on, on that. Uh, do, say, yeah, yeah, gear your questions um, towards ways that the faculty can tell you what they like about working there. So, you know, can you tell me, can you tell me the strengths of your students? Can you tell me, you know, your, the strengths of your experience with this particular research program? Um, the reason for doing that is you can, if you get the job, you can negotiate. And only after you have the job letter can you negotiate. Like, oh, I want this fellowship and this research budget and this and that. Up until the point you have the letter, um, again, you're really trying to create a reason for them to hire you. And people like when they can tell you what they enjoy about something. So. I tend to prepare a lot for these kinds of things. I make information sheets about each institution. And I might come up with a series of questions based on the institution and just keep them in my mind so that if in my interview, you know, um, someone has already said, there, were, there are many opportunities for junior fellowship funding, then I cross that off. And then at the bottom, if I don't have anything, I can say something like, um, what do you think the strengths of the program are? You can, I think, technically ask, how do you see me fitting into this program? But that's not a really great one to ask. <laughs> Usually it's tell me about the strengths.